Mesdames et Messieurs, Ladies and Gentlemen, good evening. It is a pleasure to warmly welcome you, all of you, to the Université Libre de Bruxelles. On behalf of our rector, Professor Didier Vivier, to this fifth and last conference of the cycle, Une Suisse Surprenante pour l'Europe du Futur. In the framework of this cycle, which, represent, which uh, rests upon a partnership between, on the one hand, the mission of Switzerland to the European Union, and on the other hand, the rectorate of the ULB. So in this cycle of conferences, we discussed a series of topics, such as the international humanitarian law and action, with the president of the International Red Cross Committee, Mr. Peter Maurer. We addressed the question of renewed cooperation and bilateral integration between Switzerland and the European Union with Mr. Yves Rossier, the State Secretary for Foreign Affairs of the Swiss Confederation. We shared some of Claude Nicolier's experience as Swiss astronaut of the European Space Agency and the last conference was devoted to the role of multinational organizations with the Chief Executive Officer of Nestlé, Mr. Paul Balk. This evening, we have the honor of hosting at ULB Mr. Thomas Jordan, Chairman of the Governing Board of the Swiss National Bank. Now, it is not my role in this uh, introduction to present the topic of this debate, but as we all know, recent developments in the global financial and monetary markets have had far-reaching consequences with destabilizing ripple effects in both Switzerland and the Eurozone. The past five years have been most challenging for both Swiss and European central banks. This is all the most true as decisions are taken by these expert bodies can have immediate effects, be they highly anticipated, such as the European Central Bank's recent foray into quantitative easing, or most sudden, such as the Swiss National Bank's recent decision to discontinue its exchange rate floor to the Eurozone. I wouldn't stress enough the exceptional occasion that we have to have Mr. Thomas Jordan this evening sharing with us his most valuable insights in the current context. It is a unique opportunity to address the nature and the challenges associated with both EU-Swiss relation, relations in matter of financial and monetary interdependence, but also to jointly address the capacity of the Swiss and European economies to answer exchange rate shocks. Now, before the last words uh, in this introduction, I have to say that this conference would not have been possible without a genuine fruitful partnership. And I would like to thank, and thank to address a special thanks to a number of partners, the Swiss mission to the European Union, and most particularly, His Excellency Ambassador Roberto Balzaretti, the Dean of the Solvay Brussels School of Economics and Management, Professor Bruno Van Potelsberg, as well as his team, Miss Isabel Pollet and the Tribune de l'ULB, team at the Central Communication Department of the ULB, as well as those involved at the Institute for European Studies, which I represent this, this evening, and I would like to thank, to address special thanks to Johan Robrecht, Frederic Pugnart, and Michela Arcarese. Before the conclusion, I would like also to remind that at the ULB, we have the tradition of public debates, critical exchange and open discussions, and I am sure that this conference will illustrate this tradition. As after the academic introduction by Professor André Sapir and the keynote by Mr. Jordan, we will have the opportunity to exchange with our guests at the occasion of a third long session of questions and answers. And now I give the floor to Professor André Sapir, and I wish you a very stimulating, fruitful, and pleasant conference. Thank you. So um, it's a great, uh, it's a great pleasure and uh, an honor to be here uh, to welcome the uh, chair of the of the Swiss uh, of the Swiss Central Bank. Now, let me say that uh, as an economist, uh, the crisis uh, has raised many issues about what economics is about. Uh, is economics really a science or is economics an, an art? I'm not going to answer that question, but one thing I can say is that central banking is no doubt an art. 
And in the domain of central banking, uh, Swiss central bankers are certainly masters of the art. And that's why I'm, I'm delighted to have this uh, opportunity uh, to, have to, uh, to, to welcome uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas Jordan uh, on this, uh, on, in, in this place. Now, let me just uh, remind you uh, a few things about uh, his uh, brilliant uh, career. Uh, Thomas was born in, in 1963. He went to a university at the University of Bern, uh, earned his doctorate uh, at the University of Bern, uh, worked under Ernst Baltensperger, uh, somebody with whom I have some connection uh, because Ernst uh, did his PhD at Johns Hopkins University, uh, where I also had uh, my PhD a few years uh, later. Now, you, Thomas, uh, you wrote your PhD uh, with Ernst on European Monetary Union. And it is said, although I've not read uh, your thesis, uh, it is said that uh, your thesis sort of warned uh, about the uh, possibility of a, of a sovereign debt crisis and of, of a banking crisis in the, uh, in the euro area. And indeed, uh, the title of your thesis was Seniorage, Deficits, Debt and European Monetary Union. Uh, and that's in 1993, uh, so that was certainly very much uh, foreseeing uh, some of the problems uh, that uh, we have uh, lived with in, uh, in, recent, uh, in recent years, in recent months. Now, after you did your, your PhD in Bern, uh, you did in, in the Swiss German tradition, uh, you did the habilitation, you did a second thesis, and for that, uh, you spent three years at Harvard, where you continued to work in, uh, in those issues. Then you came back to, to Switzerland. You, uh, you became an assistant professor at the, at the university in, in Bern. And very soon afterwards, uh, you started uh, to be involved with the Swiss National Bank, first as a scientific advisor, and uh, with a lot of reputation and lots of conferences that you participated and lots of papers that you wrote that immediately got a, a lot of attention from the profession. And then uh, you, you were promoted through uh, the, uh, the central bank. And uh, you were promoted uh, head of research. And in, uh, in May uh, 2007, uh, you were appointed by the, uh, by the Swiss government as member uh, of the board uh, of governors of the, of, of the Swiss uh, National Bank. Uh, then in January uh, 2010, uh, you were appointed by the, vice, uh, by the, by the government as, as vice chair of the, uh, of the board. And then uh, in, uh, in 2012, on, on April the, the 18, uh, 2012, uh, you uh, assumed the uh, presidency, the chairmanship of the, uh, of the National Bank. Now, this all in a, in a very busy uh, period, and indeed busy period, as, as you have uh, reminded us, busy period for Switzerland, busy period for the euro area, and busy period for uh, the world as a whole. And what I would like to do uh, in, my, in my very brief introduction uh, is to go over some of the issues that I think may be useful uh, to remember uh, uh, before uh, giving the floor to, uh, to the chairman for his uh, presentation. And I, I, I wanted to look at a few elements that relate to the euro area and uh, to Switzerland. I've called this a rich man's problem. Uh, Switzerland is a rich country, but Switzerland is indeed a country uh, that have had some problem, uh, but it's a rich man's problem, and uh, it's a rich man's problem with, with masters uh, at the helm of the central bank, and a problem that has been, I think, handled uh, beautifully, as uh, we, shall, uh, we shall see. Now, I start by simply looking at the GDP per capita at purchasing power parity. Uh, and I look at Switzerland in red and uh, in blue, uh, the euro area. It's the average for the euro area. And I look this against the US taken at, at 100. So if the US at a, is at 100 for, for those different years from 2002 until 2008, until the start of the crisis, you see that um, Switzerland, compared to the euro area, is, is certainly uh, relatively, uh, relatively rich. So when the crisis started, 
Switzerland at uh, GDP per capita and purchasing power parity is almost at the level of the, of the US. The euro area was still sort of relatively far, uh, far, uh, far behind. Now, the, the, the story that we know most uh, in the euro area about what has happened in, in our link with Switzerland is no doubt about the uh, exchange rate. And here I'm giving the exchange rate in the, in the reverse of what one usually gives. I'm not giving a sort of Swiss franc per euro. I'm giving euros per uh, Swiss franc to show that indeed so there's been an appreciation of, of the Swiss franc in, in recent years and sort of appreciation here is sort of increasing. So one is not talking here on, in a sense of, uh, of, uh, of a floor, uh, one talking of, of a ceiling when the rule uh, started in August uh, 2011. So I'm giving here the, the euro uh, uh, Swiss franc exchange rate from the start of the euro on January the 1st, 99 until uh, until January 2015, and those are monthly data. It's not daily data, so there's a little bit less uh, variation. It's, 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 monthly, uh, it's monthly data. Now, what you see in this monthly data, first of all, and this is what I already mentioned, you see two peaks, uh, August 2011 and uh, January 2015, and I'm sure that will be uh, much of the, of, of the discussion that the, uh, the chairman uh, will, will present to us, but I think it's good to keep this, uh, to keep this in mind. And I mean, in my view, uh, when I look at this entire period, I would break it down into three periods. I think there is a first period from 19... I think there is a first about 2010, where you see more or less the exchange rate fluctuates a bit, but fluctuates around sort of 0 0.65. So 0 0.65 euro uh, for uh, a Swiss franc, it's more or less constant. It sort of goes up, up and down, but it's more or less constant until 2010. And then there is this sharp rise during period two from somewhere we'll see in 2010 until August 2011, sort of very, very rapidly, this very rapid rise. And then indeed the central bank intervenes, puts here a ceiling, um, and, um, and we have uh, the third period until uh, last month when indeed the ceiling, uh, the ceiling is removed and again the, uh, the, uh, the Swiss franc uh, spikes, uh, spikes up. Now, is what we observed before related to, uh, to Mr. Jordan? Uh, is what we have seen really attributable to his various steps through uh, the central bank? When he becomes a member of the general board uh, in May uh, 2007, vice chair in January 2010 and uh, president or chair in, uh, in April uh, 2012. Well, there is some correlation there. Uh, you see that indeed in two, uh, 2007, when he assumes membership of, of the board, uh, we are sort of at a relatively low point uh, of the Swiss franc against the, uh, against the euro. And then there is this uh, rise. When he becomes the, uh, the, the vice chair, in uh, January 2010 is just at the point where the rise uh, is about to, to start. And then he becomes president um, in after the, uh, the, the ceiling has been put. Now, obviously, I'm, I'm joking. Uh, I, I don't mean to say that uh, a person, however masterful he may be, uh, is responsible uh, for all of this. But certainly, the, uh, the central bank has played uh, an important role. Now, what are, what are the elements here uh, related to the crisis re and related to, to, to the euro uh, that are behind this and the relationship between Switzerland and the, 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 euro, uh, the euro area? Now, the first thing I want to, to, to show is that when the crisis really starts, one can have different dates for the beginning of the crisis. Does it start in August 2007? Does it start with Lehman Brothers in September 2008? But you see that we are still with Lehman Brothers in, in September uh, 2008. We are still in the first period, in the relatively calm period. Okay? You don't see anything. Lehman Brothers happens, and you see a little bit of increase indeed of the Swiss franc, but not, uh, not very, very much. So at that time, in a sense, all of us, the US, Switzerland, the Euro area, we are all hit more or less in the same manner. And you can't see in the exchange rate something major uh, major happening. 
what is measured to happen is yet to happen, and that will come not in 2008, not in 2007 really, but it will happen in, uh, in 2010. Now, I have indicated here, I've put a line, and this line is May 2010. Now, May 2010 is, in a sense, the start of the sovereign debt crisis, and the first episode of the sovereign debt crisis in the euro area, the Greek uh, crisis that we are still uh, talking about uh, much in, in these days. May 2010, that on the 10th of May 2010, is when the, the first program for uh, Greece uh, starts. And you see that this is really the time when the, uh, the Swiss franc starts to rise a lot. There is uh, worry about the sustainability, not just of, of uh, Greece, but little by little about the sustainability of, of, the euro, uh, of the euro itself. And the Greek crisis turns into a euro area crisis. And indeed, then uh, Switzerland and the Swiss franc uh, become a safe haven uh, for a lot of capital outflows out of the, uh, out of the euro area uh, in search of, uh, of stability. And uh, we reach this high point in, uh, in August uh, 2011, the high point for the exchange rate. Now what I have put there uh, in grey is what's happening on the Italian side. Uh, Italy did not have a, a program. There was a program for, for Greece, there was a program for, for Portugal, there was a program for Ireland, there was a program for, for Spain. There was never a program for Italy. But in the summer of 2011, there started to be a lot of worry about Italy. There was a lot of worry in a sense related to redenomination re risk, that indeed there may be a breakup of the euro area. And what I show there in grey is the five-year uh, credit default swap, sort of insurance uh, on the uh, Italian uh, government bond. And you see that at that time, things start to rise really a lot. And you can see this is really, I think, what is happening. So it's not just Greece, it's not just Portugal, it's something much more major. It's at the heart of the euro area and Italy, uh, the third largest country of the euro area, starts to be under stress. And the more stress there is in the euro area, obviously the more there is capital outflows from uh, the euro area to uh, Switzerland. And this is what explains uh, what happens in, uh, in August 2011 and the introduction of the, uh, of the policy by, uh, by, the Swiss, uh, by the Swiss Central Bank. Now, interestingly, as you see on the, on, on the Italian side, there are two spikes. There is a spike in the summer of, uh, of 2011, and then there is, uh, at the end of 2011, a policy which is introduced by the European Central Bank, uh, sort of massive liquidity, that sort of brings the Italian CDS and CDS of other countries down. But then it comes back, it flares again uh, the next summer. Uh, and it flares again the next summer until the line which, uh, which I've put there, and the line which I've put there is indeed the ECB uh, OMT, uh, OMT uh, announcement in, uh, in the summer of, uh, of, uh, of, 20, uh, of 2012. And in a sense, that is the end of the euro area crisis, the central bank, although the ECB would never want to use this term, uh, but the uh, European Central Bank becomes land of last resort to uh, uh, euro area governments, and uh, very rapidly the, uh, the CDS on Italy and other countries under stress uh, come down. And, and also for, for Switzerland, obviously, there's much less inflow uh, of capital. So there is the, uh, there is the, uh, the, the, the ceiling, but the ceiling becomes much less uh, of, a, of, a, of a problem to manage, I think, for Switzerland. And then we come to the, to the very last episode. Uh, so even though much uh, was done by, uh, by the European Central Bank uh, in terms of the financial markets and in terms of this doom loop, uh, that I think you, uh, you had studied already in, in your thesis between the banks and the, uh, and the sovereigns, and something that certainly the euro area was very ill-prepared and probably should have read more carefully uh, what, uh, what you had written at that time. So even though the central bank is able to calm uh, this uh, doom loop and the introduction of the, uh, of the banking union 
uh, is certainly a very important factor, uh, we see that another uh, problem uh, arises little by little. Uh, there's very low growth in, in the euro area in 2011-2012. In 2013 is not a very good year either. And uh, the euro area uh, gets towards uh, very, very low inflation with uh, negative inflation once again in December uh, 2014 and discussion of de-anchoring of uh, expectation uh, about the uh, capacity of the central bank, of the European Central Bank, to maintain its, uh, its objective of close to but below 2% uh, uh, inflation rate. And that's what prompts in, uh, in January, uh, last month, uh, at the end of January, the uh, announcement by, uh, by the European Central Bank of a quantitative easing policy to be launched in March. And immediately, obviously, uh, that has again uh, an effect on the, uh, on the Swiss Central Bank, which is uh, not able, in a sense, to keep, uh, to keep the peg, to keep the, the, the floor anymore. Now, what do we see from this, and, and, and I, I want to stop here, uh, what do we see from this is that uh, there are two elements. Uh, Switzerland is obviously an economy which is closely intertwined with the European economy, uh, with the EU, uh, in many, many ways, in terms of trade, uh, in goods, in services, in terms of flow uh, of persons, uh, of workers, and also in terms of, of capital flows, in particular with the, uh, the euro area. And the Swiss franc uh, assumes in the international monetary system a special role. Uh, it's clear that during all periods uh, of great uncertainty, uh, whether it's gold or whether it's the Swiss franc, uh, they do play uh, a role of, of safe haven. And that requires, indeed, I think, masterful uh, management on the part of, of the Swiss National Bank to be able to, to deal with this. So uh, what, what, what is, and I, I will just conclude with this, I think what is very interesting to see is that despite the fact that this, this major appreciation of the Swiss franc that, that takes place in 2011, and despite the, uh, the, the, the ceiling that is, that is put there, uh, it remains very high and now it's going up again, uh, the Swiss economy has managed very, very well in this period and has managed, in a sense, much better than the, uh, the euro area. So I'm putting here the GDP uh, uh, put at 100 for 2008 at the start of the crisis. As we know, in blue, the euro area, the euro area GDP has not yet gone back to the level where it was pre-crisis 2008. Uh, that has certainly not been the case in Switzerland. Switzerland, had, like most other countries in 2009, uh, had a recession, but it was a very short-lived recession. And Switzerland, in a sense, has proceeded better than Germany, by the way, uh, to, uh, to regain and to go back to, uh, to, to, uh, to regain and to go. And then if you wonder uh, what happened to the, my very first slide, to GDP per capita, uh, you see that the euro area gets stuck uh, in this level where it was before, before the crisis. Uh, we, we certainly don't improve compared to the US. And again, you see that Switzerland uh, goes, uh, goes ahead and the gap now, in 2014, uh, between Switzerland and the euro area uh, is much bigger than it was actually in, in 2000 and 2008. So in a sense, it has been not a bad crisis for, uh, for, for, for Switzerland. And I think one of, one of the questions that we will discuss, and the, the, the chair will uh, address those points, and I think, I think this is a burning issue, I think, for, for any economist, as we are looking at the euro area itself and sort of learning lessons from from Switzerland that had, quote unquote, a, 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 good, a good crisis, is to understand how did Switzerland do it? Was it supply factors, were, were there structural factors, or was it a good management of macroeconomic policy, including uh, monetary policy? So uh, I turn to you uh, for the answer to those, uh, to those questions. And again, let me welcome you uh, to the university and thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to be with you today in Brussels. 
And I would like to thank the Swiss mission to the European Union and the Institute of European Studies at the Université Libre de Brussel for their very kind invitation. And I would also thank very much for the kind introduction of Professor Sapir and Professor Coman. Thank you very much. Well, when I arrived at Brussels airport today, I couldn't help noticing the range of delici delicious chocolate on offer. It seems to be as abundant as in Switzerland. So I can see immediately that Switzerland and Belgium have important things in common. This certainly makes me feel very comfortable here. Although I am unlikely to end up emul emulating Jean Neuhaus, as some of you may know, Belgium's most famous chocolatier was actually a native of Switzerland. <laughs> he came to Belgium in 1857 and decided to stay and set up shop in Brussels. As for me, I plan to return to Switzerland tomorrow again. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, Belgium and Switzerland have a lot of other things in common, besides chocolate. Both are small, very open economies, which have successfully, successfully embarked on the road to globalization. Both are, at home, are home to world-class corporations, as well as very innovative and small medium-sized medium enterprises. But there are also some crucial differences. Unlike Belgium, Switzerland is not part of the European Monetary Union, nor indeed of the European Union. Switzerland has chosen to preserve its political autonomy and conduct an independent monetary policy. As a result, the economy has at times been subject to major exchange rate shocks. Furthermore, since it is not part of a large internal market, Switzerland is particularly dependent on open international markets. The purpose of my remarks this evening is to show how Switzerland perceives its position on the international economic scenes between the two poles of attraction mentioned in the title of my speech, independence and interdependence. I will, in particular, elaborate on features which, in my view, have been key in allowing the Swiss economy to strengthen its resilience to external shocks and to fully benefit from globalization. Switzerland is known as a country with one of the highest living standards in the world. Yet this privileged condition should not be taken for granted. Quite the opposite, achieving and maintaining economic and social progress is an ongoing challenge. The years since the beginning of the global financial and economic crisis has been particularly testing. The events of the last few weeks are a striking example of this. As you certainly know, know, and you have heard it before, the Swiss franc has again appreciated rapidly and massively. I will take this event at the starting point of my presentation. Switzerland conducts an independent monetary policy and has historically had a strong and important currency that plays a much bigger role in the international financial system than the size of the economy would imply. The attractiveness of our currency as a safe haven reflects the stability of the country and is as such an asset for our economy. However, since the start of the crisis back in summer 2007, the this factor has also repeatedly been a source of pressure. The Swiss franc started appreciating in August 2007 with the onset of the US subprime crisis. The huge uncertainty generated by the collapse of Lehman Brothers one year later and the Great Recession which ensued put the Swiss franc under further upward pressure. The situation worsened in 2010 and 2011. 
The European sovereign debt crisis and the fears of a breakup of the monetary union sent jitters through financial markets. In addition, market participants were worried that the US Congress would not reach an agreement to avoid hitting the debt ceiling. To complicate matters still further, the global economic outlook turned noticeably gloomier as a result, enormous safe haven flows poured into the Swiss franc. From August 2007 until August 2011, the Swiss currency appreciated by amount by about 40% in real effective terms. Yields on Swiss Confederation short-term debt turned negative and have remained negative ever since. Confronted with such dramatic developments, the Swiss National Bank introduced a minimum exchange rate of 120 Swiss franc per euro on September 6, 2011. Against the backdrop of a rapidly deteriorating global economic outlook and policy rates that were already at the zero lower bound, these measures helped to avoid an extreme tightening of monetary policy conditions. By setting a cap on the exchange rate appreciation, the Swiss National Bank provided some relief to businesses and bought them time to adopt measures that would reduce costs and improve productivity. Nonetheless, the Swiss franc remained highly valued. However, the minimum exchange rate of 120 Swiss franc per euro was only ever meant to be an exceptional and temporary measure. A few weeks ago, on January 15, the Swiss National Bank announced its discontinuation, publishing such a decision as a surprise announcement for the markets and the public was unavoidable. No preemptive guidance is possible for this kind of decision. Any guidance would have invited speculative attacks. Markets reacted accordingly and the Swiss franc appreciated massively within minutes after the announcement. Although some of the overshooting has since been corrected, our currency is still trading at a significantly overvalued level as we speak. Once again, the reasons for the Swiss National Bank decision are to be found in international developments. In particular, over the course of 2014, it became increasingly evident that the ECB and the Fed policies would diverge. In the US, the ongoing recovery rendered the, pr the prospect of an exit from the unconventional policy more likely. In the Euro area, meanwhile, the ECB made it clear that additional monetary stimulus would be required. A tangible sign of these diverging patterns was the substantial weakening of the euro against the dollar. With the clear prospects of a significant QE program in the euro area, the pressure on the minimum exchange rate intensified hugely at the beginning of 2015, especially in the last few days leading up to the SNBS decision on January 15. Against that backdrop, the minimum exchange rate became unsustainable and the Swiss National Bank had no choice but to discontinue its policy. By maintaining the minimum exchange rate for longer, the SNB would have run the risk of losing control over its balance sheet. This in turn would have hampered the stability-oriented policy in the future. Once you have arrived at such a conclusion, you have to act swiftly. Speculative posi position taking against the minimum exchange rate could easily have caused the S&P's balance sheet to double within a few months. We would subse subsequently have been compelled to discontinue the exchange rate floor under even greater pressure with all the consequences for our balance sheet and the Swiss economy that this would have and the Swiss economy. The cost of maintaining the floor would have been out of all proportions to the benefits. 
As a consequence, the Swiss economy is now dealing with very difficult exchange rate conditions. In an independent world, in an interdependent world, with highly integrated and liberalized capital markets, the strengths of an economy like Switzerland can, paradoxically, turn into a major challenge. How should Switzerland deal with these extreme conditions? overcome the difficulties and maintain its current high living standard? To answer this question, I will now step back for a moment from current events and highlight some of the factors that historically have been instrumental in allowing Swiss businesses to seize opportunities abroad and cope with an ever-changing environment. However, let me first briefly turn to our tradition of independence. Although mostly favoring a free trade approach in its economic relationship with the outside world, Switzerland has traditionally been very reluctant in relinquish political sovereignty. In particular, federalism, direct democracy and citizen involvement are seen by Swiss population as crucial elements of their identity. They are considered key factors to ensure the cohesion of a country made up of different linguistic and cultural groups. External neutrality helps Switzerland to escape the tragedies which devastated the European continent during the last century, while maintaining internal cohesion. Hence, the two world wars fostered Switzerland's attachment to its political autonomy. But autonomy does not mean isolation or neglect of what happens abroad. Switzerland's political neutrality has often put it in a good position to mediate during conflicts and provide active solidarity. Our country has made very active use of this comparative advantage. The most well-known example is the Swiss engagement in the International Committee of the Red Cross Switzerland has also a long and well-established tradition of offering its good services for diplomatic negotiations. From an economic point of view as well, political autonomy should not and does not mean economic isolation. Today, Switzerland's economy is amongst the most internationally integrated in the world. As a small country lacking in natural resources, Switzerland started very early on to cultivate cross-border economic relations. Since then, economic integration has contributed greatly to Switzerland's prosperity. The flip side of the coin, however, is the country's broad exposure to economic and financial developments abroad, as demonstrated by the global financial crisis and its aftermath. In the wake of the global shock triggered by the Lehman Brothers collapse in September 2008, activity in Switzerland declined very significantly. However, the recession was softer and the ensuing recovery stronger than in the Euro area. There are various reasons for this relatively solid performance of the Swiss economy. First, the purely domestic banking sector was in a good shape and the economy was never faced with a credit crunch. Second, domestic demand has stayed robust amid favorable housing market developments. Third, exports were relatively resilient to international headwinds. And fourth, as we have already seen, monetary policy acted to limit the negative impact of the Swiss franc's massive appreciation. Let me now elaborate on the structural factors that have played an important role in strengthening the resilience of the Swiss economy to shocks. I will start by focusing on some interesting shifts that have taken place in the structure of Swiss international trade. Looking at the structure of Switzerland's international trade, 
will allow me to dispel some well-established preconceptions about the Swiss economy. If I ask you to list some core Swiss economic sectors, you would probably mention banks, watches and chocolate. But Switzerland is much more than that. The Swiss economy is in fact highly diversified. For example, the share in total value added of the sector comprising financial, insurance and business services is smaller than the EU average. By contrast, the share of the manufacturing sector is significantly larger. Overall, the amount of goods and services that Switzerland sells abroad is equivalent to half of its GDP. Goods dominate exports activity with a share, but with a share of one third, the contribution of services is by no means negligible. The export intensity is, is significantly above the OECD average. Switzerland is surpassed by the Benelux countries, however. Part of the gap with the Benelux reflects the extensive re-exports of imported goods generated by the activity of the world-class ports in Belgium and the Netherlands. Admittedly, access to the sea is not a key competitive advantage of Switzerland. Now, in order to maintain competitiveness, the Swiss export sector has gone through profound structural changes during the last decades. First, there has been a shift in the composition of the export sector. The pharmaceutical industry has gained in importance, whereas the share of exports of machinery has declined. In passing, let me just mention that the popular cliché which, which associates Switzerland with watches is actually true. Their share in total goods exports is sizable, about 11%. Note, however, that this has nothing to do with the cuckoo clocks, which were invented and are produced in Germany. A closer look at the development across industries reveals that this compositional shift is important in understanding Swiss performance during the crisis. In fact, individual export categories were affected very differently by the great international trade collapse in 2009. While shipments of machinery and metals suffered severely, dropping by roughly 30%, exports of chemicals and pharmaceuticals barely declined at all. As this sector accounted for more than one third of total exports in 2008, it strongly dampened the negative impact of other sectors. Exports of watches also provided important support. The second structural change has occurred within industries. For instance, the machine industry today is not the machine industry of the 1990s. There has been a constant effort to innovate both products and production processes. Swiss businesses have specialized in high value added products. Switzerland has among the highest densities of high tech industries in the world. The volume of research and development spending is driven by large multinational firms in globally integrated economic sectors, such as pharmaceuticals and chemicals. But small and medium-sized manufacturing firms in a broad range of market segments also play a key role in Swiss exports and are typically also strong innovators. More than 40% of them undertake in-house research and development, a world record. Overall, thanks to this innovation strategy, the contribution of the manufacturing sector to Swiss GDP has been remarkably stable since the beginning of this century, breaking the previous downward trend. The third structural change concerns the regional composition of Swiss exports. Swiss exporters have increased their focus on the US, China and other emerging economies while relying less on traditional markets such as Germany, France and Italy. 
this stronger diversification turned out to be very helpful during the financial crisis. Indeed, exports across regions evolved differently. Shipments to Germany, France and Italy declined much more at first and then picked up much less substantially than those to the US and China. Despite this increasing regional di diversification, Swiss exporters remain strongly dependent on the European, U or European market. Today, the EU market still absorbs more than half of Swiss goods exports. The European sovereign debt crisis, amid the sharp weakening of domestic demand in the euro area and the dramatic appreciation of the Swiss franc against the euro, has thus heavily weighed on Swiss exports. While the demand effect dominates, the negative impact of the exchange rate is very significantly too. Overall, and despite the strong appreciation of the Swiss franc, Switzerland exports of goods declined somewhat less in the crisis than the exports of other European countries, such as Germany or Belgium. The structure of the labour market also plays an important role in strengthening resilience to shocks. Strengthening resilience must provide the necessary flexibility for firms to adjust rapidly to changing conditions at home and abroad. A key characteristic of the Swiss labour market is the combination of little layoff protection with a fairly generous unemployment insurance system. If they have to, firms can reduce their workforce with relatively few administrative impediments. Conversely, when the economic situation improves, firms will readily hire new workers again. As a consequence, the outflow rate from unemployment is higher in Switzerland than in most European countries, with the exception of the Nordic countries. Another important institution is short time working. It was used extensively by firms during the crisis. Short time working enables firms to adjust their labour force to temporary shocks without destroying existing job matches. This is a crucial advantage, especially for businesses operating with a highly skilled workforce. It effectively cuts costs during the downturn while allowing businesses to quickly expand production once demand picks up again. A further key feature of the Swiss labour market relates to the way employers and employees interact. Generally, labour management relations are good and disruptive strikes are rare. In the context of wage setting, many employment contracts are regulated by collective labour agreements. However, in contrast to the situation in other countries, these agreements are typically the result of consensus-oriented negotiation which with very limited government involvement. In fact, the instrument of collective labour agreements is regulated by only three short paragraphs in Swiss law. The negotiation setup typically guarantees that firms and industry specifics are taken into account in the arrangements so that competitiveness can be preserved. The high employment rate among the domestic working age population shows that the Swiss labour market is in good shape. Currently running at 80%, employment is almost 15 percentage points above the European average. Another supporting factor for, Swiss economy, for the Swiss economy is sound public finances as reflected in a relatively low fiscal deficit and public debt. This fiscal discipline is related to the political institutions of direct democracy and federalism. Swiss voters tend to be pragmatic and have generally shown little inclination for large and creative public projects. Furthermore, fiscal decentralization is pervasive. The cantons the main subnational entities are like sovereigns on a smaller scale 
and have extensive taxation and spending powers. In Switzerland, regional autonomy enhances control of public spending and accountability. One element of the incentive scheme is the tax competition among cantons. The cantons are free to set their own tax rates or establish new taxes. As companies and individuals can vote with their feet, canton governments have an incentive to strike the best possible balance between the tax burden they impose and the public service they provide. These traditional elements were complemented at federal level with a stringent debt break mechanism in the early 2000s. The experience at federal level motivated various cantons to follow suit. This has proved to be a very effective fiscal policy reform. The debt break is a rule that links expenditure to the amount of cyclically adjusted revenue. It aims at the balanced structural budget over the medium term. Fiscal policy maintains a counter-cyclical profile through the mechanism of automatic stabilizers. The strict implementation of this rule led to significant budget surpluses in the boom years preceding the global financial crisis. Importantly, the debt break has made it possible to regain control over public spending, which had steadily increased during the 1990s. Since the main focus of the debt break rule is on long-term sustainability, the framework leaves little room for discretionary spending. The federal government can make an exception and allow additional uh, emergency spending only in the event of a proven severe crisis. During the recent crisis, the healthy state of Swiss public finances enabled the automatic stabilizer to play their role to the full extent, which contributed supporting to supporting the economy without threatening me, uh, medium-term fiscal stability. In particular, public spending on the unemployment and short-term workers, unemployed and short-term workers increased significantly, while income and profit tax revenue decreased. Contrary to what have Seen in, have seen in other countries, no tax increases or austerity measures were needed to correct the public finance trajectory. This has had a positive impact on households' disposable income and hence on both private consumption and business confidence. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me now wrap up my presentation and add a few words about our current monetary policy. Switzerland has a long history of political independence. At the same time, the country has consistently pursued prosperity by a strong integration in the world economy in general and the European economy in particular. Through this active international integration into the global economy, the country has achieved and maintained a high level of affluence. However, the notion that Switzerland is a sheltered island in the midst of a stormy sea could not be further from the truth. For a small open economy like Switzerland, the international environment is a source of both opportunities and large destabilizing shocks. The unavoidable discontinuation of the minimum exchange rate against the euro is a powerful example. It provoked a strong reaction on international financial markets and, as a result, the Swiss franc appreciated sharply. The significant overvaluation of our currency means that the Swiss economy, notably the sector exposed to international competition, is currently facing strong headwinds and a number of challenges. The Swiss National Bank has lowered interest rates to unprecedented levels to caution the effects of the currency appreciation. The lowering of interest rates means that holding Swiss francs is significantly more costly than holding foreign currency. The negative interest rates 
is said to have a corrective effect on the Swiss franc valuation. Moreover, the Swiss National Bank will continue to take the exchange rate situation into consideration when formulating its monetary policy. It will therefore remain active in the foreign exchange market should this prove necessary in order to influence monetary conditions. Nevertheless, the near future will see major challenges in Switzerland. Today, more than ever, the Swiss economy has to focus on its structural strengths and flexibility to ensure its international competitiveness and thus the country's prosperity in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Mr. Jordan has uh, kindly agreed to, uh, to answer questions and to enter into a debate. We have about um, half an hour. Uh, so um, I think we heard uh, a very interesting presentation. Um, the Swiss case is obviously very, very, very interesting. Uh, I mean, in, in many, many ways. Uh, as I said also in my presentation, and I think you, you showed it uh, very well, if, if, if I start with this. Um, the, um, the Swiss economy has managed to deal with the, you, you, you use the term, overvalued exchange rate, right? And no overvalued exchange rate for, for a while, and we don't know <coughs> where, where it will go. I think you, you, you have shown, uh, as, as I was talking about, sort of the, the supply and the demand factors. You, you show the strength sort of, of, the, of the Swiss economy in, in, in structural manner ability to, to, to change sectors, to upgrade uh, itself, to have also the labor, the labor, market, uh, labor market flexibility. Nonetheless, uh, there are limits, isn't it? Um, so how do you, how do you see the, 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 months, uh, the months ahead uh, for, the, uh, for the Swiss economy? We have seen so far, things have been mm. pretty good, mm. but now, you know, how far will, uh, will the Swiss franc uh, rise and uh, mm. what kind of effect, how resilient will the economy be forward? Well, at the moment it's clear that we have a clearly or significantly overvalued Swiss franc. So usually markets realize that, especially if you have also uh, negative interest rates and that should correct over time the value of the currency. But nevertheless, at the moment we have a very strong overvalued currency which makes the situation for the Swiss economy very, very difficult. So at the moment, it's also hard to forecast exactly the growth rates we will have for 2015. It will be clearly lower than what we expected in December of, of last year. Uh, but it will depend first on the level of the exchange rate, then on the uh, international uh, business cycle, the uh, international European situation will improve, the American economy will continue to grow. And third, also, of course, on the flexibility, on the capability of Swiss firms to adjust to this situation. Please introduce yourselves for, for our speaker mm. when you, you ask your, your question. Please. My name is Mendel Goldstein. I was a former uh, official with the European uh, Commission in the external uh, relations sector. And I am now the president of the alumni of the European Studies Institute of this university. Mm. Thank you for a very clear uh, and detailed uh, uh, keynote speech. Um, two questions. First of all, um, I would like to know, um, you, you have said that, that Switzerland was considered a, a sure heaven and, and, and got a lot of uh, inflows from US, from, from mm. uh, the EU. Could you tell me if um, the recent uh, uh, problems about uh, um, the nature of some of those inflows and the, the negotiations you had, some of the major uh, Swiss <coughs> banks had with, uh, with the United States, the penalties they had to pay, and uh, also now the, the most recent, recent reports about HSBC, 
uh, will this not have any effects on, on the future inflow of capitals to, to Switzerland? That was the first question. The second question about uh, the labor market. You mentioned there's a um, uh, very high employment rate, um, uh, but uh, on the, um, the same side, um, uh, I guess you, you have taken some measures, or you will take some measures, in order to uh, um, protect or, or control the inflow of uh, migrant uh, migrants in general, even from the EU, but uh, even more so from, from other countries. And I wonder if, uh, how you will do that uh, in order to, uh, to have enough uh, 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 workers in, in Switzerland. I guess the birth rate of the Swiss are, are as low as, as here in Europe. So I wonder how, how you will manage uh, uh, this problem of, uh, uh, of keeping up high mm -hmm. employment. Uh, while having to apply those restrictions, I guess. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for this question, or these bo both of the questions. Well, the first question, uh, in my view, uh, the inflows has nothing to do with uh, the bank or the problems of the banks with other countries or, or the United States. It's more uh, in, in, the f in the period in 2010, 11, 12, it was basically the fear of uh, the breakup of the European uh, Monetary Union. And uh, that led to a lot of inflow in, into, into Switzerland. And uh, the, the, the recent inflows uh, at the end of 2014 and beginning of uh, 2015 mainly had with the change in monetary policy to do where it, was, it became really pressure on the Swiss franc uh, to appreciate. And that was the reason. So I do not see any relationship with uh, uh, the, the points you mentioned before. Uh, the uh, labor market is very important for the Swiss economy. So the, we, we have a very flexible labor market that uh, helped the economy uh, and uh, it was very important. We had a lot of inflows in, into the labor market, uh, um, immigrants that came to Switzerland. Uh, as you mentioned, there is a, it's a discussion in Switzerland, but this is, I'm not the expert on that, this is more a political issue where the, the government has to deal with, uh, now with the European Union to find a, a, a solution there. But uh, uh, beside that, I guess the, the, the most important for the economy is the flexibility. As I mentioned before, uh, the possibility to increase the labor force and decrease the labor force depending on the economic situation. And that helped uh, the firms a lot. And that also led to a, a big increase in employment in, in general over the last uh, couple of years. Was a question there? Yes, yes please. If a couple of years ago, can I, you just uh, my say name, who you? Yeah. My name is Kabanga. I'm a researcher as well as a legal consultant to a foreign government. I attended a few years ago at the University of Bern, Bern, which is the capital of Switzerland, um, a seminar regarding two burning issues. One, the safe haven issue, and number two, the bail issue, BAL issue, BAL one, BAL two, BAL three, and so on. Um, what I was hoping to get from you is your opinion as to wh where BAL stands right now. Uh, that's the first point. And the second point is that during that seminar, there were many accusations with regard to the fact that fortunes were accumulated in Swiss banks by people from the, for, uh, the third world, including presidents. President from Congo, Mr. Mobutu, president from Duvalier, from Haiti. And they were accusing the Swiss government or the Swiss institution for not doing enough for the repatriation of those fortunes which were illegally accumulated in Swiss banks. So I need to have maybe <coughs> your opinion on those issues, if that's OK. Yeah. Thank you again for that. Well, thank you for these questions. Well, to your uh, second question, I cannot say a lot. It's a clear strategy of the Swiss government uh, to, to have only taxed uh, uh, wealth in Switzerland that banks uh, manage into the future. So there was a clear change in policy over the last uh, couple of years. 
in that direction, what we call the white money strategy, uh, and, and uh, this is, uh, is, is a very clear uh, strategy. But the, 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 f the other question about the uh, ball one, two, and three uh, situation, this is about banking regulation. This is import very important, I, I guess, for the world, but uh, also obviously for, for Switzerland. This is an international setup for banking regulation and has several elements, including also uh, the dealing with uh, too big to fail banks. So to make the financial system safer, uh, safer and uh, in our view, and, and Switzerland already implemented Basel III, uh, the uh, concept fully, is very important and uh, we belong to those countries who advise all other countries also to adopt this uh, Basel III uh, pro process because it will make the, the financial system worldwide uh, a much uh, safer system and which is important given the experience we made from uh, out of the financial crisis. Thank you. If I can ask you a, a follow-up question on this. Um, so before, before the start of the, uh, of, the, of the crisis of Lehman Brothers, indeed yeah. there were some Swiss banks that got into difficulty. Mm. UBS yeah. was very early in the, uh, in the, in the crisis. Uh, in a sense, it was partly lucky to come early yeah. and uh, was recapitalized uh, very early. Um, and then the, uh, the Swiss authorities um, became much more demanding in terms of, of capitalization. Um, so uh, 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 an avenue that has been now followed also by, by the UK, in a sense more than the, uh, the EU countries, uh, have been more demanding, in, clearly in Switzerland and, and, and in the UK, where the, uh, the financial uh, industry is, is very important for the country. Yeah. And I mean, you, you talked about uh, too big to fail, yeah. and I know that you're, you're involved in this as well. Now, I wanted to ask you about uh, leverage uh, ratio. I mean, how do you uh, how are you implementing mm. this in 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 Switzerland? Mm. Uh, are you already uh, mm. have you anticipated on the new uh, on the new rules, or you are like some of the European countries uh, lagging behind, yeah. uh, sort of taking time to uh, to uh, to comply mm. uh, because there's not yet a need mm. to, uh, to 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 comply. Yeah. So, what is the situation there? Well, th thanks a lot for this question. Um, I guess Switzerland realized that uh, as a small country, having a big financial center, it's very important to have a well-capitalized banks. So, so this was a very important insight after the beginning of the financial crisis. Switzerland implemented already higher standards and uh, is continuing improving th those, uh, those standards. And for the uh, big banks, those uh, who are considered systemically important or too big to fail if you want, uh, uh, we implemented already a combined requirement, so a uh, risk-weighted asset uh, requirement, but also a leverage uh, ratio uh, um, uh, requirement. And we have now to see what uh, is coming out of the uh, final decisions then out of the Basel III and FSB approach with, with regard to uh, uh, systemically important banks in order to adjust uh, the Swiss regulation. So this is now a process that is also set up by the government with a uh, expert commission to, to look at this and, and uh, the aim is really to have uh, really banks that are the best capitalized in the world in, in order to have a very safe system. Thanks. Next question. Yes, please. We need a microphone. A microphone over there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Corinne Barthélemy, I'm now living in Switzerland for about 10 years. We have a wealth management company. And uh, so when it happened on the 15th of January, we were quite surprised as on the Monday, the ba so Bank uh, National Suisse had said that normally the taux plancher should remain at 120. And on the Thursday, suddenly the markets dropped and the franc went up. So. <coughs> Why, within such a short period, a change, not of mind, but a change in the policy? Why was that so quick? Well, <coughs> again, thanks for this question. The answer is that it became evident in uh, early January that the policy of maintaining the minimum exchange rate is not anymore sustainable. 
the prayer ship became too big and we had to risk really with interventions of hundreds of uh, billions of Swiss franc. And so that made it evident and clear that the, the policy cannot be maintained. And uh, instead of continuing the policy for some time, if you know already that it's not any more sustain sustainable, uh, it's much wiser to act immediately and to change, uh, to change the policy. So, so that is the reasoning behind uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the decision that we have taken in, in January. No, th this is not the business of the Swiss National Bank to intervene in uh, negotiation between the firm and their uh, em employees. This is something uh, really a, a private contract between the, the firm and the employees and the union between the, the firm. Nothing that is, is, uh, has anything to do with monetary policy or the Swiss National Bank. My name is Jean-Jacques Ré. I used to be a director of the National Bank of Belgium. And uh, I, I, I'm now the husband of a Swiss wife. <laughs> I live about half of my time in Switzerland. I observe that uh, the mood of the population is not particularly favorable to uh, joining the uh, Europe or, or joining the Euro at, at the time. This is a clear fact. So one should not expect anything of the, uh, in, in the near future. But abstracting from that, I was usually of the opinion, say 10 or 15 years ago, that the main economic reasons which prevented uh, Switzerland to join the, uh, were one, the differential in interest rates. So there was an enormous gap between the interest rate on the major European currencies and the interest rates on, on the Swiss franc, which were already very low. And second, the, the, the fiscal practices which made uh, Switzerland very uh, careful about its own independence, mm. fiscal independence, uh, 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 and in some, some respects very favorable uh, to, uh, uh, for, 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 uh, for, for, for uh, epargne, uh, savings. Uh, now, on both factors, things have considerably uh, evolved. And the interest rate gap is much less than before, and the, 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 the Swiss are gradually moving to an international acceptance of the fiscal practices overall. So, I mean, it seems to me that these two obstacles have essentially disappeared. Are there other economic factors which I have forgotten, which justify, the, uh, continue to justify uh, Switzerland uh, keeping out of uh, Europe? And thank you for the speech. So, uh, so it's, it's not a political question, it's sort of asking what are there fundamental issues yeah. of, of structural differences or, or other that make the, the two economies in a sense not mm. compatible with one another? Or is it yeah. only a, a notion sort of politics and the sovereignty that you, that you discussed yeah. in your presentation? Well, this is a very difficult question because it comprises uh, a lot of, of different things. So you have the political uh, debate uh, because you have a different tradition uh, to citizen involvement than in the rest of Europe. I guess this, this is a very important uh, point. Uh, with respect to the economic issues, I, I think uh, it's very difficult to say only because of the last few years uh, the interest rate differential became smaller. That has to be all the time the same. So I guess at the moment we have compressed interest rates everywhere. But one day we will have again a normalization and the interest rate differential can go up again to a traditional level of uh, 100 to 200 basis points depending on, on which country you, you compare. So I guess you have to look at that or, or to, to consider that in the, very, in the very long run. I guess the big advantage uh, is that uh, some of the macro policies can be uh, decided in an autonomous way. So monetary policy can orient it towards the needs of Switzerland only and not in a larger context. On average, that uh, was beneficial for Switzerland. But as I mentioned before, sometimes you have to live with very severe and uh, painful ex exchange rate shocks. So you have always uh, both, both, uh, both sides. Uh, you have, all, all other, on the other hand, also the fiscal uh, s situation where you have a little bit of a different situation where many of the fiscal decisions are taken also on cantonal levels. Uh, which then lead to a relatively robust and sound uh, fiscal situation. So you have many things, I guess, believe at the moment people 
believe it's still an economic advantage, but uh, obviously then that may also change ov over time. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Next to Jean-Jacques, and then here in front. Good evening. I am a PhD scholar in law uh, on a Erasmus Mundus uh, bursary from South Africa. So I'm not an economist, but I would like to know, I've heard all the statistics about your country, and I've also heard that your country has no minerals, and it does a lot of export. I really want you to explain how come the country's economy is so strong. What is, what is driving the Swiss franc to be so strong? If you don't have minerals, and is it just the export? Is it other people's money that comes into your country? What makes the Swiss franc so strong? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, let me mention two points, in my view, that are important. First, I guess it's the stability of the country as a whole. So political stability, economic stability, and not only over a few years, but really over decades that Switzerland remained very, very stable and that uh, made also or contributed to the strength of the Swiss franc. Then on the other hand, you have uh, not a very strong export sector that is uh, in pharmaceutical, in watches, in machine, etc. So this is all knowledge based. So we have a lot of highly skilled workers, engineers, uh, scientific people who work, work in this, this industry. And that led then to products that are of extreme value added and high value that we can export at, at, at high prices. And that determines then also salaries in all the other sectors. So, so the salaries that can be paid in the export industries define the salaries that can be paid in services uh, where the differences in productivity between Switzerland and the rest of Europe or the rest of the world is not so big. So, so that then helps really to maintain a very, very high level uh, living standard. So I guess these are the two main points uh, that uh, contribute and these are the structural factors uh, that also help to develop those uh, export sectors over a very long time and the flexibility of the economy to adjust to different uh, uh, involvement or developments in, in the world. I guess th these are the key factors that uh, made Switzerland uh, in a way a rich country and also the Swiss franc a relatively strong currency. It's quite simple. <laughs> Next question. Uh, the microphone here in front. Yeah, I have a question too, but he can okay. Okay, ask go first ahead. if he wants. Uh, I'm Tom, I work at a Belgian asset manager. Uh, just two short questions. Um, can you give some examples of the risks of controlling your balance sheet that you mentioned? And uh, if you mean the default risk of the assets that you already purchased, is there some kind of law that would force you to pass that uh, loss to the government? Or can you just incur it uh, yourself? Thank you. I'm not sure whether I understood your question uh, correctly. So, so you ask about uh, losses of the Swiss National Bank and the, the, the question about negative equity. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, through the appreciation of the Swiss franc and given the fact that m almost all our assets are foreign exchange denominated, we suffered uh, a loss. And uh, uh, th th these, these are complicated issues, but the fact is uh, a central bank can also operate with negative equity. And uh, usually, usually you absorb losses first by your capital and then you have to rebuild the capital uh, through uh, future seniorage or revenues you get on get your, uh, on your assets. I think w what is really important in that uh, context is that uh, uh, you have to be very careful uh, how you use your balance sheet. So a, a central bank should not hesitate to use your ba the balance sheet if you can achieve the monetary uh, goals. And, but you have uh, you should not use it in a way uh, or it takes a, a larger balance sheet if you already know at the beginning 
that you cannot achieve your balance sheet, uh, your, your goal, monetary goals, and you will suffer losses for nothing. So, so this is, uh, I think, the, the crucial difference or distinction you, you should make. Uh, we made in the past uh, losses, and uh, we recovered losses through uh, seniorage again. And if you have uh, not uh, sufficient capital, then you cannot make transfer to the governments, and that should not have an impact on your policy. But you should not uh, use the balance sheet for, uh, if you know already that you only create losses and you cannot achieve your goals. I think this is a very important distinct, uh, distinction that is not always made also in academic uh, writings. Thank you. So that's, I, I was referring to the art of central banking. banking yeah. So it's not an exact science, yeah. that's for sure. Yes, next question. I think we take one or two more <laughs> questions and then we left to close. Uh, Matthew Dalton with the Wall Street Journal. Um, just to follow up on that question, so does that mean if, if you feel you knew already ahead of time that, that the PEG was not going to be able to achieve um, your monetary policy goals, does that mean um, it seems like the, the policies that you've replaced it with are less vigorous than, than the PEG? So does that mean that there's really no policy out there that, that you feel at the, the current moment can achieve those goals? And also, does um, the unusual, owner, unusual ownership structure of the bank, um, the fact that it's owned by the regional governments, does that, um, you kind of alluded to it just now, but uh, does that have, what kind of impact does that have on your, um, your decision-making process, the fact that they weren't getting uh, their, normal, uh, their normal profits from, from being owners of the bank? Well, it's very simple. It has no influence at all. So the ownership structure has no influence on policy, on monetary policy. Uh, we have a very clear rule for transferring profits to the government. We have a target for the level of equity or the level of capital. If the capital is lower than the uh, targeted uh, capital, there is no profit distribution. It's very simple, it's very clear, and it's very good for the bank. It protects the, 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 the bank in case of, of losses. So the ownership and the, the profit transfer has no implication at all on our, uh, on our monetary policy. So this is, uh, this is very simple. That, yeah, could you repeat the first question again? Yeah. First question is, you said that you, you seem like you were saying before that the reason why, yeah. you, the reason why you abandoned the mm -hmm. peg is because it, you, you anticipated that, sh that it wasn't going to be successful in achieving your goal and no. that it amounted no, to no, a big expense. I, I think that was a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. I said, if you know mm -hmm. that the current policy maintaining the peg is not, not sustainable anymore, mm -hmm. then I think it is ir irresponsible to intervene for hundreds of billion if you know already that it's not sustainable mm -hmm. and to use uh, the intervention, uh, interventions that are in a way, uh, you, you cannot even by intervening a lot, not maintaining the policy. So I think th this is the, is the crucial point. So I think th this is the... You know. So we'll take two questions there. Uh, mm. is the, oh, you have the microphone. Mm. So we'll take the two questions and then you'll wrap it up, please. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Yes, my name is Steven De Fila. I'm a, <coughs> a former, uh, I'm a Swiss, I'm a former employee of the Swiss Economics Ministry and at present expat here in Brussels directing an international energy agency, intergovernmental energy agency. Um, I have followed uh, on distance uh, by mass media these, uh, these events and um, of, I had the impression that uh, something was already in the air before it was decided. Uh, but my question still was a little bit, I was surprised that it came so abrupt in one go and one change. Why didn't you make it in sort of going from 120 to 115 to 110 in a gradual approach? Uh, this is one question. The second one, do you have any advance indicator indicating uh, which would uh, sort of what would happen in, what would have to happen in the Swiss economy that you would uh, come back to, 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 to a controlled exchange rate? Thanks. Well, to answer your first question, I think if you have a system of a minimum exchange rate, as we had, when you start to change the system, going back to 115, this is an invitation for markets to speculate against this new minimum exchange rate. So it's not 
credible, credible for this time. So the only way to do it is the way we did it, uh, to, uh, uh, to stop having a minimum exchange rate. Uh, and uh, th that's for, for this reason. The, the other point is, uh, well, we made it very clearly that we are looking at the exchange rate situation as a whole, and if necessary, we are active in, in the market to, uh, to have an impact on, uh, on monetary conditions. So this is uh, uh, the strategy that we have uh, for the time being. Thank you. So one very last uh, question. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your speech. It was really very, very enlightening. I, I'm, a, I'm a consultant here in, in, in Brussels. One question coming back to your previous answer. What was your anticipation on the 6th of September 2011 in terms of the length of time you had envisaged for the mm. peg? And what was the working hypothesis then? Well, that's uh, quite a difficult question because, well, we expected that the situation in the Eurozone will improve uh, and uh, that uh, the minimum exchange rate is only temporary, as it was now. But the hope anyway was, uh, in any case, was that the recovery will be uh, stronger and quicker than actually it, uh, it took place. So that was the working hypothesis. But we were clear from the beginning that the forecast of the, this is very, very difficult and unknown. So, uh, uh, but we are still convinced that it was necessary and it was a good decision on September 6, 2011 to introduce it. Uh, we had it now for a little bit more than three years, almost three and a half years, and it uh, provided both time to the Swiss economy to adjust to, to this now, again, more difficult environment. So I suppose the year, I mean, as I, as I showed in the graph with the Italian CDS, so when, uh, when you introduce the, uh, the, the, the policy in, uh, in the summer of 2011, this is when there is the risk with, the, with Italy. And it takes another year until the ECB uh, implements or so decides uh, OMT, which is really the, 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 the game changer. So I suppose that, that year, from the summer of 2011 to the summer 2012, which was a very long year uh, mm -hmm. for everyone, uh, with the fears with the, with the euro, must have been especially uh, very, very long uh, for you. Uh, hoping that indeed the change of policy yeah. would come from Frankfurt and that uh, you would be a bit more relaxed, yeah. isn't it? Well, it was especially uh, between uh, May and uh, September 2012. It was a difficult time because that was the height of the, uh, again, the, the, the Greek uh, uh, crisis and the discussion about uh, the breakup of the monetary union. And obviously with the announcement of OMT, that uh, was then uh, changed and uh, gave a big relief that this too. So let me thank you once again. This was really a, a master, masterful uh, performance and I think it was in a sense a master class. Uh, anybody who wants to understand, as I said, the, the art, not just the science, but the art uh, of central banking, uh, I think would have mm. uh, really gotten a lot of value for mm. their money. We thank you a lot and uh, we thank also the the Swiss uh, mission here in Brussels for helping us to organize this event. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.